if if France puts troops on the ground, they'll be slaughtered. If Britain puts troops on the ground, they'll be slaughtered. If the Americans deployed an expeditionary force of a couple of hundred thousand men, they would be slaughtered. The Russians are winning this war. The war's effectively won. They captured Adivka. Adivka has been fortified by the Ukrainians since 2014. They blasted their way through it. The Ukrainians can't form another defensive line. Ukrainian brigade strengths are about 30%. We're being lied to on a massive scale about what's going on there. And we've also been lied to about the capability of our own armed forces. Our armed forces would be worse prepared for this war than we were in 1940. The nature of war has changed. If you can see something on the battlefield, you can destroy it. And the fact is, that's what's happening. That's why the Ukrainians are losing. They're fighting magnificently. But Britain, no, no NATO forces has adequate air defences. They don't have the numbers. They don't have the artillery superiority. And they don't have the industrial base to support them, as your, your uh, expert said earlier. It would be a disaster of a monumental scale. And if we do commit troops, that will be an invitation to not to Putin, who doesn't want to expand the war, because why try to control territories that will be hostile to you? But it will be a temptation to others in Russia who will say, we are strong, the West has proven itself weak. It's a very dangerous thing that, that Macron is suggesting. When you talk about they'll be slaughtered, they'll be slaughtered, they'll be slaughtered, um, I'm just looking here at, and again, these these figures are never definitive, but it all of the statistics I can come across from various different organisations uh, suggest that Russia has lost more troops than Ukraine. That's not true. And you can tell it's not true. Shall I tell you how you can tell it's not true? Please do. Because you can literally see the graveyards from space. Earlier this year, the Ukrainians was, started to organise uh, new, new graveyards that would, would be capable of having an one and a half million graves. They've lost at least 500,000 dead or missing. And that's more than their army was fully mobilised in 2022. This is effectively the third Ukrainian army. And they lost tens of thousands of troops in their summer offensive. So you, you're saying that do? Russia just has a, has a better army than the combined, better forces than uh, both ammunition and people than the combined forces of Western Europe and the United States? Yes, they do. The Americans don't have, the Americans have always relied on the fact that they have air superiority. They control the air. That would not be the case in Ukraine. The MiG-31 has, has an air-to-air -air missile, as the Ukrainians know to their cost, that can shoot planes down from 200 miles away. We have no equivalent to that. Airfields, all our aircraft require, you know, long airfields to operate from. The Russians have hundreds of ballistic missiles that can hit a target within, within five metres. You need, you need the capability of destroying missiles, destroying drones um, and destroying aircraft with air defence. And NATO is notoriously weak in this area. There were two Patriot uh, launchers destroyed earlier this uh, last week. They were destroyed by a ballistic missile. This, this couldn't, you couldn't do this 20 years ago. It was impossible. Missiles weren't that accurate. If you look at the battlefield footage that you see, you'll see four or five guys running because if you have a concentration of more troops, then either side will use artillery. And artillery in, in every war since 1914 has killed 80% of the casualties. Mm. The Russians have 10 times as much artillery and they have 10 times as many artillery rounds. The Americans have one factory that makes artillery rounds. It will take them, uh, it's going to take them till 2025 to manufacture more than half a million rounds. And the Russians are firing 10,000 rounds a day. That's why the Ukrainians are losing. So why are we, we are bothering? Not prepared for because too many politicians have put too much into this and there's been too many lies told. And to be, fa to be honest, there are British troops on the ground. The SAS, I'm certain, is there because they've been planning lots of the attacks against the Black Sea Fleet. 
the French are there. The French lost 50 mercenaries, so-called mercenaries in, in a missile strike last week. We're not being told the truth about this. And as I say, well, don't I, well, prove to can, the enemy... Hang you're... on, you've had a full speech, Simon, if I could just come in. You've said a huge number of things there, so do let me speak. Um, it, 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 the, 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 you have painted a picture of... Uh, if if America is still the world superpower, I mean, I know the ground, the seismic shifts are happening on that <coughs> front, but you've painted a picture of a superpower um, that would be knocked out in days by, by Russia. And Russia so far has not been able to knock out Ukraine in two years. Because if you're going to do that, you have to lose large numbers of troops. Taking a, a, no, but a you're, the picture was... you've painted is that it's an impossibility. <coughs> It's an impossibility for the U.S. to deploy troops that will be adequ adequately protected in Europe. It would take and months. And why is their air force the there. intrinsically, uh, you know, piffling compared to, to Russia's? In your view, in terms of the conventional aspects of their force, the non F thirty five F twenty two aspects of their force, they would find that, that they would find it impossible to operate over the battlefield. The, F, the, the stealth aircraft could operate, but even they will be vulnerable. What do you think you we... Know, the Russians, Russians have the most sophisticated <laughs> air defences in the world. They spend a lot of money uh, on it. OK, and... thanks. Thanks very much, Simon. We've got a lot of problems. We, it's been going on two plus years now, and I don't know whether any of us expected it. And, and, and from the beginning, I was born and didn't know how long it was going to last, whether it's three months or whatever, and try and help them as much as we can. But... Mm. This is just going to drag on and on and on. And, and can we afford to get in, drawn into a, a war with Russia, the whole of Europe, or the whole of NATO get drawn into it, and then the Chinese get involved, the Americans get involved? Mm. We, we've caused enough problems around the world trying to solve other people's problems, thinking that... But these aren't other the people's West, problems, are they? Well, Do, well, don't you think an emboldened, an emboldened Putin who has taken Ukraine or chunks of it is a problem for us? It, of course, it's a problem for us, but we we can't solve it by going to war. What what what, what will war solve if we go to war? What what is it solving? Do you know what I mean? We're, we're two years down the line. Why have we waited two years to all of a sudden think, oh, we're going to go in? Do you know? We've, we've, no, we've no, 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 this, no, no, no. This we've is put all that's these embargoes not, that's, in place against no, but that's Russian mis oligarchs. I think that's, and yet they're still. I, no, hang on. Where I, are they getting their equipment from? Sheila? Right. We're talking about them running out of equipment. I know, but hang on a sec. Uh, saying that, why Why all of a sudden after two years are we saying go in? We're not saying go in. Uh, Macron has just raised the issue. He's raised the, the, the flag, I guess. But right from the beginning, it's been a question of, right, we will support you, but from afar. You know, but there was all, it always hanging over that was, if this doesn't work, what? What then? Yeah, I'm not clever enough to know what goes off in the background. Surely there's got to be conversations and whatever, but he's not wilting Putin, unfortunately. He is not Neither wilting. Neither are Ukraine. Uh, and, well, they won't do because they're getting bankrolled, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Well, they've been invaded it, it, and they'd like it, their it, country it, back. Listen, I, I, I totally 100% get that, and I'm not I'm not a, at all a Putin supporter. I'm just, But how can the rest of Europe keep funding it? You know, that's my argument. We can't just keep throwing money after money mm. with nothing happening. Why would we just keep throwing money into a bottomless pit and nothing's changing? That, that's my, my case. So something has got to stop. You know what I mean? We, we can't, we have to get them around the table and say, look, what is it we're after? And, and again, and if I'm not, Putin I'm not, says the whole of Ukraine. He doesn't say that, though, does he? Again, I'm not massively... I don't know, he hasn't been round the I'm table. He hasn't been round but, the table it yet. Was, so. it, it was the Donbass and, and all that sort of region. And I, I don't know enough about the history of it, and, and I'm not here to say, oh, I know all this, the Ukraine-Russian politics. But You're just saying talk, not war. Trump, exactly that. We can't go to war. Look, look what we did in Iraq and... It's a very different situation, John. It really is a very different situation. And to bring it back to Macron and what he has said, I mean, you know, he's known to have a bit of an ego on him. He's talked about, you know, he's, he's trying to position himself as, you know, post Angela Merkel, the big guy in Europe. Um, is that partly at play here, do you think? I think, I think Macron, as you, as you say, Macron has got a very big ego 
And so ego is always a part of what drives him. But he's also a very smart guy. And perhaps we should give him a little bit of credit for uh, the journey because Mm -hmm. he's actually realized that what he said two years ago just doesn't apply now. And I think in that sense, he's always been a strategic thinker and recognizing the consequences for Europe of losing in Ukraine is, I think, very is a, is a smart move. It's a more imaginative move than some people who are still, if you like, trying to tri- triangulate on a rather narrow basis. And you've reminded me actually earlier on in our conversation about the talks that he had and the meetings that he had at the very beginning of all of this with Putin on that very long white table because it was still COVID times, wasn't it? Um, he's essentially, if you can at a table that long, seen the whites of his eyes and found him wanting, has he? I think so. I I think what you've seen, there is actually, although we keep trying to deny it, there's a consistency in what Putin has said about Ukraine, which actually goes back to 2008. What what we didn't realise was not just that he meant it, but that he was going to act in the way he did. There is an absolute iron rod consistency uh, in what Putin has said. He has not deviated and what we've just not done is we just keep believing, does he really mean it? Yes, he does. Mm. 